you can come rejoicing. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I am so excited about what the Lord is doing in our churches. Hallelujah. I'll tell you what, I'm still reeling from Sunday morning. Whoo, glory. Amen. Hallelujah. But we want to begin a new series tonight on Wednesdays. We just finished with the series entitled Activate. I think it was five parts. And uh, on activating the gift of God within you by getting involved in the local church. But now we want to begin this series, in, and I've just entitled it The Healthy Church. The Healthy Church. What does a healthy church look like? Uh, what would a healthy church entail? Now, uh, I believe it'll be six parts, but we'll see. Amen. Could be more. Glory to God. My wife calls me the sermonator, and so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Amen. Uh, praise God. But you know, in reality, all pastors have that ability to take a subject and just try to, try to get every nuance of meaning out of it. And, uh, but the healthy church. Now, in order for a church to be healthy, that church must stay in line with the vision and the purpose that God gave it. Now, we know that the vision of, of this church is to build faith and frame worlds by the Word of God. Hebrews chapter 11, 3. Let's go to Hebrews 11, 3. And uh, notice it says that through faith we understand the worlds were framed by the Word of God. And that the things which are seen did not come from the things that do appear. So the purpose of this body, the vision of this church, is to build faith and frame worlds by the Word of God. Amen. So the vision, as I said very often in the, in the other series, is a divine revelation of the purpose of the church that you attend. So the divine revelation of the purpose of this body is to build people's faith and frame worlds by the Word of God. Now, first of all, how big is that vision? Here's how big that vision is. City, state, nation, world. That's how big that vision is. All right, city, state, nation, world. Now, in some element, the fellowship, in, by and large, that you're a part of, the fellowship of churches, we're already doing that. Touching the city that we're in, the state that we're in, the nation that we're in, and the world that we belong to. All right, as, as human beings, uh, as a fellowship. I mean, we have churches in Ghana, West Africa. We have churches in Ecuador and Colombia. We have Bible College in Ecuador. We're soon to have Bible College in Ghana, West Africa. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're things are, God's doing what He said He would do. But here's the point. So how big is that vision? City, city state, nation, and world. We've got to understand and, and recognize faith builders is task oriented. We're task oriented. What does that mean? Our task is to develop people to do the work of God. That's our task, to develop people to do what God has asked of them to do. Amen. And what God has asked you to do, He's given you a vehicle in the local church to do it. Amen. Do you see this? The Lord said to me, one time, matter of fact, I was sitting on the front row right here, and he said to me, he said, a church can be built on different things. And then he went through these things. He said, personality, trends, uh, cultural ties, meaning black church, white church, Hispanic church. And then he said, it can also be on, built on the anointing and the Word. And then he said this, the only one that's lasting is the anointing and the Word. And he said to me, this is not necessarily fast growth, but it's sure steady growth. Not necessarily fast growth, but sure steady growth. I remember one time I was, I was visiting with uh, a person that I have much confidence in. 
and uh, pastored for many, many years, has pastored for many, many years. And I was sharing what the Lord had dealt with me about some things uh, where the church is concerned. And he looked at me and he said, Philip, he said, that's not the fastest way to grow a church, but it's the best way to grow a church. Now, now understand something. I take no credit for that. I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do. All right? So it's not that I have some otherworldly wisdom or that I'm some great, you know, uh, uh, specimen of a minister. It's that the Lord will speak to anybody that will listen to Him. How do I know that? A donkey listened to Him. And the Lord used the donkey. Amen. Sometimes I want to remind preachers of that when they're running around talking about how they're the cock of the walk. Hey, God used a donkey and a rooster. He'll use anybody that'll listen to Him. Amen. The prophet wouldn't listen, but the donkey would. Praise God. <laughs> well, hallelujah. Do you see this? So we want to look at this tonight. We want to look at these things that the Lord said. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3. And number one, the healthy church. So the Lord had said a church can be built on different things. Or 1 Corinthians, I said 2, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 3. And uh, so let's look. He said, first of all, it can be built on personalities. So let's look at this. Personalities. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 3. He's talking to this church. He says, for you're yet carnal, because there's among you envying and strife and divisions. Are you not carnal and walk as men, or mere unchanged men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, notice, but God gave the increase. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So Paul is saying from the start, this ministry that you've been partaking of is not built on a personality. It's not built on the person. Amen. Now, don't, don't misunderstand this. You know, God doesn't anoint ministries. He anoints men that go into the ministry. Any ministry that is functioning today, the person that God placed there is who is anointed and it flows into the ministry. But Paul's saying it's not personality. Amen. It's not personality. The person has been placed there by God to fulfill God's purpose. Do you see that? For a church to be healthy, you have to understand that the minister, the pastor, the leader has been placed there to fulfill God's purpose. What does God want for that body? Well, God wants this body to build faith and frame worlds by the Word of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you see that? The people that God uses for work in His kingdom are servants called to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ. That's the goal. That's the plan. I remember one time, Pastor Michelle and I, uh, we used to drive up here to, uh, to film the broadcast. And uh, she, uh, we would go to uh, Agape Church on Wednesday evenings. And then we would film on Thursday mornings. And I remember one night we were walking in. And uh, I, don't know if I, I don't remember if I was with you or if you told me this. It's one of the two. I don't remember for sure. I, I think I might have been there. If, if I wasn't, you can correct me. But when we walked in, there was a, a brother sitting there, and he, and he looked, and he saw Pastor Michelle, and he goes, Oh, we have a celebrity in our midst tonight. And real quick, Pastor Michelle said, No, not a celebrity, just a minister of the gospel. <laughs> Amen. See, you, 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 you got to be careful with that personality thing. Amen. you, you got to be careful with that, because people try to build on a personality. Well, the problem with that is personalities are fallible. Amen. Personalities can fail. 
as a man or a woman of God, we're simply, notice, we're simply doing what God asks us. That's what's happening. Amen. Say out loud. Say, I'm just doing what God asked me. Amen. That's it. That's all I'm doing. Now, notice in Luke 17. Luke chapter 17. And verse 10. Luke 17 and verse 10. Jesus says something here. The Lord first showed this to me. I was, I was leaving a, a conference in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. And I was headed to the airport early one morning. I had to catch an early flight. And I was headed that way. And I begin to meditate on these verses. And uh, he's talking about the servant here. And he says in verse 10, So likewise you, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, he says, say this, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Now, the King James kind of makes that seem like, you know, you shouldn't think much of what you're doing. One translation says, so learn this lesson. After doing all that's commanded of you, simply say, we are mere servants, undeserving of special praise, for we're just doing what is expected of us and fulfilling our duties. Amen. Did, do you see that? Now, that's, that's not an area of disrespect where we open up a door for disrespect for the gift or the, or the office that God's placed a, purpose, a person in. It's how that person thinks about what they're doing. The Bible says that the people that rule over us and are in authority over us in our churches, that they are worthy of double honor. Right? That's what the Bible says. But that person that's worthy of double honor has to keep their personality in check. I'm just doing what God asked me to do. Amen. That person cannot get pumped up by the praise of people or brought down by the criticism of people. Are you following me? It's, I'm just doing what God told me to do. I've had people come up and say, oh, pastor, the message you preach has changed my life. Praise God, I'm glad it changed your life, but I'm just doing what God told me to do. It's the Word that changed your life. It's not me, it's the Word. Thank God I had a part in it. Amen. And I thank God for my part in it. Do, do you understand that? But what keeps me humble is knowing how bad I can preach when God isn't in it. Amen. It, if it's really good, it was really God. If it's really bad, that was me. Amen. Right? You understand? Personality. When you try to build a church on personality, when you try to build a church on your own giftings and talents, then at at there was, there was a man that built a wonderful church one time years ago, back in the 80s, in uh, Texas. And it was, a, it was a, a powerful church. It was a big church. It was a large church. had a Bible college, uh, television ministry, international television ministry. But uh, it got to where he consistently had to do more and more things with his personality to try to keep it going. Amen. The thing about building a church on the Word of God is this. You never run out of building materials. Because the Word is, 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 the Bible says, it's a never-ending source of wisdom. Am I helping you with this? Amen. Glory to God. And so, that doesn't mean, like I said, that we don't honor those in positions of authority. But you know, I've noticed something about the people that I really, that I really have a lot of respect for. Now, that, now they, they put up with me because I'm, 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 a, I'm a person that believes in giving you your roses while you're alive. You know what I mean? I don't want to talk about you real good after you're gone. I want to talk to you real good now so you'll know how much I love you. And especially the people that have impacted my life, they put up with it. But most of the people that I have great respect for, if you start talking about them too much, they'll quiet you down. Because it's not about them. Amen. It's about what God can do through them. Do you see this? So the Bible does say to give those men and women double honor. There's a great blessing that comes upon people that honor the gift of the pastor in their life. But you've got to understand something. We always keep the emphasis on God. 
Amen. I, I've had people say, well, you know, coming to Faith Builders changed my life. Coming to Faith Builders, hearing the Word changed your life. Amen. You got you to keep that in mind. Why? It's not about a personality. One time, uh, Brother Hagin told a story about uh, a, a minister in the days of the voice of healing. And man, this guy was an evangelist. He had an evangelistic anointing. And I mean, he would go to conferences, you know, Bible conferences. Well, let, let me use an example. I don't know if you've, if you've ever seen this. You know, Brother Copeland's Believer's Conventions, you would think that everybody there is saved. It's a Believer's Convention. I don't know if you watched it this, this year, or you might have been there, but one night he had Jesse come up and give an altar call. And they kept coming and coming and coming and coming and coming. I mean, I don't know how many minutes it took for the altar to get full. And then they, while he was praying, they were still coming. In a believer's convention. Why? There's an anointing of an evangelist on him. Well, this guy was the same way. He would go to, to, to conferences where it seemed like everybody was safe and the altar would be packed. They could give an altar call and get a very sparse turnout. And then he would get up and give an altar call and the place would be jammed. And he did that one time in, in a meeting that Brother Hagin was in. And uh, they got done and they were, they were talking there after church. And uh, Brother Hagin said he was standing by this minister and another minister. And uh, one of this ministers said to this man, he said, uh, that was just the most amazing thing I've ever seen. He said that, that, that turnout of that altar call. And he said that guy reached over and grabbed that man's tie and, and just did this to it and said, yep, yep, if I can't get him, nobody can. And, the, and Brother Hagin said the Lord spoke to him right then and said, now you watch from this moment on, his ministry is going to go down. And he said, I watched and it went down, 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 down. Amen. You know what, you know what keeps me in check in some areas is I know where I've missed it. The only, the only way you could, you could justify having any kind of pride in your personality or yourself is if you could say, I have never sinned. <laughs> and there's only one person that can say that, and it's Jesus, and the hallmark and the most distinguishing characteristic of Jesus was His humility. The, the, one of the first things that, that, that Paul reminds us of about Jesus is that He humbled Himself. Amen. So I'm saying this, in a healthy church, you're not going to see a lot of personality-driven ministry. The youth group is not going to be personality-driven. No area is going to be personality-driven. It's going to be word-driven. Amen. Do, do you see that? Glory to God. Number two, he said it can be built on trends. Trends, T R E N. DS, trends. What is a trend? A change or a development towards something new and different. A trend or a development towards something new or different. To be a healthy church, trends have to be avoided. Trends have to be avoided. I know I probably don't need to remind either of our churches of this. New doesn't mean better. Have you ever gotten something new and it was worse than the old one? I have. Amen. Man, you'll just learn your phone and you'll just learn how to get everything working, right? And then they'll update the thing. They'll update the software and you're like, what happened? This is not as good as it used to be. New is not always better. Now, we don't, we, don't, we don't hold back from the new thing because the book of Isaiah, God said, Behold, I will do a new thing. Will you know it? So I need to be looking for when God moves. But I, I want you to understand something. It's not a trend. We're not, we're not following the trend. You can build a church on a trend, but what do you do when the trend changes? Amen. Do, do you see that? One, one recent trend, and we've seen it, and, and I'm not against anybody that does it. I'm just saying it's a trend. One, one recent trend was all this dressing down. 
blue jeans, t-shirts in the pulpit. You know, it became in vogue and stylish for the pastor to get a bunch of tattoos. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't agree with going and getting tattoos. I'm not running anybody down that's got them or somebody that went and got them. But here's what I'm saying. That's a trend. And, and it was a trend towards fitting in. It was a trend towards trying to make everybody comfortable. It was a trend of trying to reach this generation. Amen. You, you don't reach people by coming to their level. You reach people by staying above the fray and showing them that you have the answer to their issues. Oh, am I helping you tonight? You can't build a church on trends. Look at Matthew 16 and verse 18. Matthew 16 and verse 18. Say out loud, we're a healthy church. Tell your neighbor, say, you're part of a healthy church. Hallelujah. Matthew 16 and verse 18. Notice what Jesus said. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, what is this rock? The rock of revealed knowledge or the Word of God. The rock of revealed knowledge. What did Peter say to him just before this? He said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock, not Peter, upon the rock of what you just said out of your spirit, you're Peter, you're a little rock. And on this, this revelation that you just spoke, I will build my church. What was the revelation? You're the Word. You're the Anointed One. And Jesus said, that's what I'm going to build my church on. Not opinions, not trends, not the latest, greatest model Amen? Did, did you see that? On the rock of revealed knowledge. Oh, glory to God. Do you see that? Trends attract people who are looking for trends. And, and I've got personal experience in this area. Trends attract people that are looking for trends. I remember one time, a person, a, a, a minister came to our church in the church there in Kansas. And uh, we have worked very hard, just like we work very hard here, to have quality and excellence. And, and uh, uh, we, we have a, a, a good setup there, and, and we've got a good setup here. But they saw the way we had things set up and our lights and the way that we do things. Well, they went back and, 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 and felt, they felt the presence of God and the anointing of God and, uh, uh, in that location. And during the praise and worship. So they went back and set their lights up the same way. And tried to do everything that we did. And expected the same anointing. You don't get anointing from lights. You get anointing from the Holy Ghost. Amen. I've told people for years. Listen. The, the, the way I. Listen. My parents. We grew up. I grew up my parents pastoring storefront churches. Alright. We were blessed to have an upright piano and a bass drum. But you give me an upright piano and a bass drum, I'll take you places you've never been. Amen. Because the anointing would hit. Glory to God. How about Sunday morning? How about that spirit of worship that descended on us Sunday morning? Amen. Glory to God. With, with, with the keyboard and two voices. But man, all y'all were singing and the glory of the Lord fell. And we spent, how long did we spend singing a cappella and the glory of God falling in this place? Why? Because it's not a trend. It's not based on how many people we have in the praise team. It's not based on how many instruments we have or we don't have. It's based on the heart of the people. And when you're determined to bring your supply to the church that you belong to, that is a healthy church, God will meet you. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Do you see that? The problem, though, with this is that trends change. Trends change. I wonder what all those pastors that got rid of all their preaching clothes, you know, suit and tie, what are they going to do when the holy jeans and the, and the t-shirts and the tattoos go out of style? 
when that's not the trend anymore. Now, I'm not saying I'm right because I've stuck with a suit and tie. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying when it all comes back, I won't have to go buy anymore. <laughs> Amen. Trends. Trends. You remember when you used to come to church? You used to come to church, and uh, when you came in, you came in the foyer, and it was, it was like you were entering, listen to me, a holy place. Amen. You, you would never think of eating a Big Mac in church, in the sanctuary, or drinking a cup of coffee, or a latte, right? But now that's in vogue. Now, there's no, I don't have anything wrong with a church having a coffee shop. I don't have anything wrong with that, anything to say about that. But, you know, when, when you, a person can feel comfortable just coming in and sitting in the church and kicking back and sipping on a latte while the praise team entertains them, that's a trend. That's a trend. Well, the problem with that is trends change. Then what? Then what do we do? Well, if I've been going after the trend, then I've got to change and go after the next trend. It's better just to stay with the Word. Amen? Isn't that right? I remember in, uh, in the, the, the late 90s, mid-90s, late 90s, revival services became the trend. Now, again, I, listen, I attended the Brownsville Revival. I attended the Smithton Outpouring. There, there were mighty moves of God, and I was touched in my heart. All right? Uh, for, for years, a couple years, in, in the Kansas location, we had Friday night outpouring services. I mean, they were some of the best services of the week. They were, they were powerful. But the Lord had to deal with me to stop that because we started attracting people that were just in the revival trend. They didn't want the outpouring of the Spirit. They didn't want to change. They just liked the emotion. They liked the manifestations. People falling on the floor, people laughing, people getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And they would come, and the, and the Lord would have me go in a different direction in the Word. And they, they would be so determined to see these manifestations, they would make it hard to preach because they were trying to pull you another direction. Are you following me? Amen. It had just become a trend. Well, then we started teaching the Word on Friday night, and guess what? They left. Where'd they go? Somewhere where they could participate in their trend. You follow me? You can build a church on trends. You can build a church on the newest doctrine. You can build a church on the most popular doctrine. You can build a church on a doctrine that seems deep. Amen. And people will leave going, wow, that was deep. How you know it was deep? Didn't understand anything I heard. <laughs> then, then that means the person teaching probably didn't know what they were talking about. Because if you don't understand it, I'm not doing a good job of teaching it. Amen? Oh, thank you, Jesus. No matter which way the pendulum swings, our job is to stay with what God told us to do. Because everything, and you mark my words, everything in the body of Christ, it will all come back to center eventually. Because it has to. Amen. Now, number three. He said a church can be built on cultural ties. Look at Colossians chapter 3. Am I helping you with this tonight? Cultural ties. Colossians chapter 3. A healthy church doesn't try to build on cultural ties. I remember one time a person asked Pastor Caldwell, you know, Pastor Caldwell built that great agape church with the Lord's help, and a racially integrated church, black, white, Hispanic, Asian. I mean, just many of you know that. But uh, so, uh, a pastor called him one time and wanted to meet with him. 
And uh, so he went and met with him. And here's the question the pastor had. He said, we, we see that you've, you've caused your church to be racially integrated. Here's, here was his question. We want to know how we can get some black people in our church. Pastor told him, he said, that's tokenism. You, you just want some black people as a token to look like you care. Amen. Do you see this? I read one time where a, man, a black man said this. He said, I could never go to a church pastored by a white man. See, it's cultural ties. Now, understand something here. Colossians 3, verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing you've put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Very important. Watch this verse. Where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond nor free, notice this phrase, but Christ is all. And in all. Christ is all. Say that out loud. Christ is all. Amen. Now why is this so important? When he says Greek nor Jew, that refers to racial prejudice. There's not Greek, there's not Jew. So in Christ, there are, not, there are, there are no black man, white man, Hispanic man, Asian man. That doesn't exist. Do you see this? Amen. But, but, but you have people that are building, building their churches on this cultural bias, this cultural ties. I saw on television one time, uh, there was a, 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 a big church, and they had, they, had, uh, they had people that were driving quite a distance from what we would refer to, and many refer to as the inner city. And so they decided to start and a, a church in that area so that these people would have a closer church to come to. And they were primarily African-American people. And so uh, they put in an African-American pastor. Which, listen, I'm all for that. Here's what I'm talking about. There's another church, African-American church. The pastor got so upset. He got on TV. He put a sign out, put the letters on his sign. You know, talking about how you need to, you, if you're black, you need to stay in the black church. You don't need to go to a white church. Listen, if, we, if the church can become so racially divided that I start looking at, at somebody who's African American and that's all I see, then, it, then it's a cultural issue. And you got people trying to build on cultural ties. White church, black church. Paul said there is no Jew or Greek. He said in Christ that doesn't exist. Then, circumcision or uncircumcision, that's religious bias. So that means in Christ there's no denominational bias. Baptist, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Methodist, Lutheran. Amen. There are people that build churches based on bashing other churches. You can't do that. Then he said barbarian or Scythian. That's cultural distinctions. Educated, uneducated, poor, rich, homeless, not homeless. Hallelujah. Do you, do you see this? You can't build a church that way. When Pastor Michelle and I had not been, we hadn't been in the ministry very long, and uh, we, uh, I was assistant pastor at a church, and she was head over the helps ministry, or one of the heads of one of the departments in the helps ministry. And uh, the Lord directed us uh, to begin a ministry in the inner city, there in Kansas City, down around uh, 10th and Indiana, uh, down around Independence Avenue there, which is right in the middle of the inner city. And uh, we started getting people saved. We started getting pe families saved, people born again that wanted to come to church. And so the church had a van, and, and I asked the pastor if I could use the van, and uh, she reluctantly said I could use the van. But before I did, they wanted to come up with a list of, of, of things and talk about it. 
Well, they knew we were going to be bringing some homeless people and some different people to the church. And so they came up with this whole list that they wanted to pass out to everybody and put it out in the foyer so that everybody that came in could see it. And it was these things, you know, like, ladies, keep your purse uh, close by you. Uh, you know, don't let your kids uh, go anywhere alone. And it was all based on these people that we were bringing. Well, listen, I'm not saying that any, but the, some of the people that, that we were going to bring didn't fit that criteria. But here's my question for you as a healthy church. What's the church for? Who are we supposed to be reaching? We're not just a smorgasbord buffet for people who are already saved. Amen. Keith Green used to sing a song and he said, Bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord. You know, that's all I ever hear. And he said, here's the problem. We're asleep in the light. Amen. I'm not saying you. I'm saying that's how a lot of people look at things. But we can't ever afford, if we want to maintain a healthy church, we can't ever afford to decide and dictate who's allowed to come and be saved and be a part of what God's doing in our body. We can't decide they have to fit a criteria. Amen. Because why? Then that's a cultural bias. Amen. I remember one time I was meeting with uh, two ministers. And one of them is a, a, a white man, and he pastors a predominantly African-American church. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, when I say predominantly, I mean predominantly. And uh, the other was uh, an evangelist. And we were talking, and this was just about the time that uh, uh, Mr. Obama had been elected president. And uh, the pastor that pastored the predominantly black church, he was a good man, is a good man. I, he's, he's still very dear to me. As a matter of fact, he's my brother-in-law. And uh, we were sitting there talking in the restaurant, and uh, he made the statement. He said, you know, I know that a lot of people in my church voted for Mr. Obama. Well, the evangelist got this look on his face like he'd eaten something sour, you know. Now, I'm not agreeing, I'm not saying that, I didn't vote for Mr. Obama, okay? I, I'm just, I'm not saying I agree with that, but here's what I'm trying to explain to you. That uh, eventually, that, so that was a problem, then eventually it got around to immigration. Well, at that time in Kansas, uh, Constitutores de Fe was just, it was, it was really beginning to thrive, the, the, the Hispanic ministry. And... Uh, I knew by personal fact, because I had talked to the people, and, and I knew that the largest percentage of the people that we were ministering to were not here legally. And I knew that. And it came up, and, and they, this, this man made a big deal out of, you know, this immigration issue. And when I told him that a large part of the people that I was ministering to were not here legally, oh, he just lost it. And it came out of my mouth so quickly. I said, no government, our government, nobody's government will dictate to me who I can show the love of God to. You just won't. It's not my job to determine whether that person's here legally or not. My job is to show the love of God to them. My job is to make sure that they hear the gospel. The Bible says you care for, love, and share the gospel with the alien. Am, am I helping you with this? If we want to be a healthy church, and we are, but if we want to be a healthy church, then the cultural norms, who's the normal person? Amen. We're not a white church. We're not a black church. We're not even a mixed church. We're the church. That's who we are. We're not a Hispanic church. We're the church. Amen. When, when I talk about the, the constructores de fe and faith builders, I say we are one church that speaks two languages. Just like we're one church in two locations. Hallelujah. 
Do you see that? Say out loud, we're a healthy church. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Bond nor free refer to social barriers. Rich, poor. What side of the tracks you live on? North Little Rock, West Little Rock. England, Stuttgart, Conway, Bryant. Who cares? What's that? Do you see that? My mail. Where do you come from? Who cares? As long as you're here. Amen. There, 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 there is no social barriers in a healthy church. As far as God is concerned, all those distinctions are made man, man-made. Christ is all. Everything else is man-made. Christ is all. Glory to God. Do you see that? Christ is all. Now, then number four. The anointing and the Word. He said you could build the church on uh, personality. You could build it on trends. You could build it on cultural ties. Or you could build it on the anointing and the Word. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Hallelujah. Verse 1 and 2. Now, let me say something before we get into this. You know, something that plays into what I was talking about with cultural ties is, you know, nowadays the, the big thing is to be tolerant of everybody. Tolerance is the first step toward acceptance. The Lord told Pastor Carl, well, you years ago now, and I wrote it down. He said, be careful, of, be very careful of that word tolerant. Because when we talk about cultural bias and cultural ties, people will say, well, you know, if somebody comes in that's, that's you know, homosexual or transgender, so that means, that means you're not, you know, you're not going to, no, 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 no. Sin has nothing to do with cultural bias. If a person's a homosexual, I welcome them in my church. But in order to be comfortable in the church, they're going to have to change. Amen. Why? Because the Word is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Can I share a story with you real quick? I got about five minutes. I should be able to get, if I don't get real preachy, I should be able to get done. Amen. But I, I remember one time there was a family and they, they invited a, a, a homosexual couple to the church in the Kansas location. And you know, they came, and, and you know, I mean, uh, it don't take a rocket scientist, you know, especially if you have the Holy Ghost to understand someone's homosexual. And uh, you know, I'm not the kind of person that just jumps on things like that, boy, I'm going to get them. No, I preach what the Holy Spirit has me to minister. And the Holy Spirit had me ministering for several weeks on a, a different thing. And man, they came and they even started bringing a Bible, if I remember correctly. And I mean, uh, enjoying the Word. And I'd see them during worship, lifting their hands. I knew they were as gay as they could be. I didn't say anything. People said, why didn't you say anything? The Lord didn't tell me to. But I remember one morning I got up and the Lord said, you're supposed to minister today from Romans chapter 1. Now, I knew right away, now, I can do this one of two ways. I can come out gunning, or I can minister this, what Paul say, in love. And I got to that point where he said, they turned the natural use of their bodies against nature and burned in lust, one toward another, men with men, women with women, working that which is unseemly, and they received in their body the just recompense, the judgment of God. And because they didn't like to retain the knowledge of God in their minds, God turned them over to a reprobate mind or a mind void of judgment. And I ministered that. Amen. Well, I, even after that message, they talked to me, came, shook my hand. You know, they never came back to the church. But you know, they had, before that message, they had heard so much of the good word of God. And then in that message, God exposed in love that what they were doing was incorrect. 
They will not step into eternity and say, I didn't know. But see, as a healthy church, nobody turned them away at the door. Nobody said anything. Amen. What happened? The Word exposed. The Word sifted. Does that make sense? So 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the quick and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Notice, preach the Word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Notice, he says, preach the word. Well, what do we preach? Preach the word. We preach the whole counsel of the word as well as the specific part of that counsel that God gave us to minister. We preach the whole counsel of the word. But there's a specific part that God gave us to minister which is primarily faith in the Word. Amen. Do you see this? But the first job of the church is preach the Word. Amen. In his book, Saving Our Cities, Pastor Caldwell made this statement. He said, but as a church, we're called to preach the gospel. And that's what we're going to do. That's what we're here for. That's the assignment of the church. Is preach the gospel. Amen. Preach the gospel. So no matter what's going on in the church world, our job is preach the word. Why? That's what you build the church on. The Lord said that's what lasts. Is the word and the spirit. Now notice 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6. Oh, this is going to be a good series. 2 Corinthians 3 and 6. He says, Who also, talking of God, hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, of the Word, we could say, not of the letter, so not of the law, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit giveth life. So notice, we need both. We need the Word and the Spirit. Brother Hagin said, all Word you dry up, all Spirit you blow up. <laughs> so you need a combination of the two. You need the Word and the Spirit. you got to flow in the Word and the Spirit. So as a body, we're never afraid to preach the Word, and we're never afraid to let the Spirit move. Amen. Now, it doesn't happen all the time, but I've come to church before, and the Holy Spirit started moving, and, and there wasn't what you would call just a, a take, take a text message. The Word went forth in some semblance, but the Holy Spirit just took over, and there wasn't a lot of preaching. Now, that can't happen every service, because the church is built on the Word. That's the admonition that we get. But you, you cannot fail to allow the Spirit to move. Hallelujah. So we're never afraid to preach the Word and never afraid to let the Spirit move. People say, well, but, you know, uh, uh, that's speaking in tongues, you know, and, and people wouldn't understand. Listen, listen, where's the Bible say that? There are pastors. I, I heard a pastor friend of mine say something one time that a friend of his said, you know, we've, we've stopped all manifestations of the Spirit because people don't understand it. There's a wonderful couple that, that, that go to the Kansas location and, uh, you know, when they first started coming to the church, they didn't know anything about the movement of the Spirit. Anything about tongues. And, you know, the first Sunday they came, now I do, I do there just like I do here. There's many Sunday mornings that I'll get up and I'll say, now everybody, let's just pray in the Spirit. We are, we are Pentecostal. Pentecost is not a denomination, it's an experience. Amen? And we started praying in the Holy Spirit. And you know, they, the, their own testimony, they went to FBMA, graduated last year, and, and, and uh, their own testimony was, you know, everybody's praying in the Spirit and they're looking at each other going, what is this? And they said, but you know, we stood there, and the more we stood there, the better it felt. Amen. And they said, and then pretty, pretty soon we, we started liking it. And then the next thing you know, they get filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Well, what drew them? What brought that peace? The Holy Spirit. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says rather that when you allow the Holy Spirit to have His way and to manifest in the church, that there will be people that come in that are sinners that will hear the manifestation of the Spirit and will fall on their face and say, God is in this place because the Holy Spirit revealed the hidden things of their heart. I had a man get saved one night on a Monday evening prayer meeting. Uh, a lady brought him to church. He was, this guy was a heathen from way back. A heathen and a hood. I mean, he had been, he had been in jail almost more than he had been free. And he came in and, and the Holy Spirit started moving, and boy, he hightailed it. Well, he couldn't leave because his ride was in the Spirit. Well, the Lord told me to go out and talk to him in the foyer. And I went out and talked to him in the foyer. His name was Dwayne Petty. And I, I believe he's in heaven today. But in any event, he was a, a young man younger than me at the time. And when I looked him in the eye, the Holy Spirit began to talk through me through the word of, of, of knowledge. And I went all the way back to when he was eight years old and the Lord took him from the time he was eight years old all the way to the age that he was and described every area of his life. God is my witness. By the time I was done talking to him, he was on his knees repenting. I didn't preach to him. I didn't give a scripture on the wages of sin is death. The manifestation of the Spirit caused him to repent. When a person comes in the service and they get a word of wisdom or a word of knowledge from somebody they don't know that's never met them and it's right on, that will change their life. You can't be afraid to have the Word and the Spirit. I heard a minister recently that, that pastors a mega church and has a few, you would call them mega churches under his watch, and I'm not against him, but he made a statement. He said, uh, uh, you know what? Well, you know, I hear people describing us as a Pentecostal church, but we're not really a Pentecostal church. We're more of a contemporary church. So when did being spirit-filled become a bad thing? It's part of a healthy church. The, the church that people are always pointing to in the book of Acts, that was the baby church. We're supposed to be more mature than they were. They were the baby church, had consistent, constant manifestations of the Spirit. Constant, consistent re-infillings and re-infillings of the Holy Spirit. So should we. What keeps a church, and I'll wrap it up with this, what keeps a church vibrant and alive is constant infusions of the Holy Spirit. Constant infusions of the Holy Spirit. Listening to the Spirit. Following the Spirit. The people learning to follow the Spirit. The people learning to operate and function in the gifts of the Spirit. That's what keeps a church alive and vibrant and active. Amen. Do you see that? To be a healthy church, that's what it requires. Amen. And what you'll see and what you'll come to know is that the more that a church, the church that you attend, the more it moves in that vein of the Word and the Spirit, here's what happens. The more real and the more relevant and the more and the stronger what God wants you to do becomes. Amen. Do you see, do you see that? Glory to God. Hmm. Healthy church. Not built on personalities. Not built on trends, not built on race or cultural ties, built on the anointing and the Word. Let, let, me, say, let me say this one thing the Lord said to me because uh, I wrote it down because it's so important. He said, and, and He actually said this to me not too long ago. He said, we have to hear in our spirits the exact plan of God. And then He said this to me, forsake hurrying, grasp steadiness. Make steady progress toward the desired goal. You know, I've been pastoring long enough to, to, to recognize things. And, uh, you know, people will, will, I've had people ask me, well, you know, how is it that so-and-so's this and so-and-so's that? And they seem to be drawing it. How come this, look, 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 look. I'm not responsible for anybody else's church. 
I'm just doing what the Lord told me to do. Amen. Amen. Do you see that? And that's what we got to focus on. What did God ask us to do? And then forsake hurrying and just make steady progress towards that goal. Because our goal is to see your family saved. Our goal is to see your lives enriched. Our goal is to see you function in everything that God wants you to function in. And if we achieve those goals, then we've achieved our purpose. Amen? Hallelujah. Let's stand up tonight, shall we? Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I got my partner coming to help me close out. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Can you say hi? hi. Can you wave at everybody on the camera? Hi. hi. Yay. Oh, okay. Can you give me a big hug? Oh. Amen. Praise God. Well, we will be back Sunday morning uh, at 10 a.m. for another great faith building time. Amen. Uh, Saturday night at 6 p.m. Uh, we also have, uh, obviously, our Hispanic service. So uh, if you uh, want to come out to that, I'll be ministering. So I'll be ministering in English with a good interpreter. Amen. But uh, in, in case, if you don't have anything to do, but, you know, I understand. But uh, we, you will be at bowling Saturday Amen. afternoon, though. Amen. Hallelujah. Pastor Larry told me tonight, he said, uh, people are going to think we stack the deck. And I said, well, you know, I can't, can't help what people think. So hallelujah. And Lexi told me she got a new ball and new shoes. And she told me I could use her new ball. And I thought, dear Lord, she lets me use that new ball. It's all over. It's all over. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I'm going to have fun. Amen. We're going to have fun. So praise God. Come on, let's say the vision of our church together, shall we? Hallelujah. Together with our Together Kansas. with our Kansas family. Praise Hallelujah. Hello, everybody in Kansas. I look forward to seeing you this weekend. Amen. Are you ready? The vision, vision of, of this church, church is, is to build people's faith and, and frame, frame their world by the word of God. God. And you, you and I will, will always be world changers. changers. God bless you. Hallelujah. Is that good, Lily?